Part of this video is sponsored by MyHeritage. This is gyudon, a Japanese beef and rice bowl I could eat every single day. And while a lot of Japanese recipes require a ton of skill and mastery, the gyudon recipe I developed for this video can be done in even less time than your rice needs to cook. In this video, you'll learn about one of my favorite flavor combos in all of cooking, why dashi is a game-changing ingredient for home cooks, and we'll quickly go over poaching eggs, which contrary to what you hear is actually actually not that hard at all if you pay attention to one thing, but we'll get to that in a second. My name is Andong and this is my recipe for Japanese style gyudon. Let's start with the foundations. And the foundation of this dish, of course, is rice. You wanna be sure to use some kind of short grain rice. I'm using sushi rice, which I think is ideal. But then there's another question, which is how much rice do you need? First of all, I'm hoping you own a rice cooker because if you do, it probably comes with a cup like this. And for me, the rule of thumb is one of these cups is enough for two regular servings of rice. Before we do anything else with this rice, we want to make sure to rinse it very well. Add the washed rice to your rice cooker of choice. And by the way, for those of you who've been following my channel for a while, I got this rice cooker roughly three years ago for like a test video to see if it's worth its very high price tag. And back then my verdict was, hmm, maybe not so much. I just eyeballed the perfect amount of water. How good am I? But now that I'm a few years in and I've learned to use the features of this machine properly, I gotta say this is definitely worth the premium, even though a regular 35 euro rice cooker will also do the job just fine. But it will not do this. This recipe is so simple that we have more than enough time to get everything done by the time the rice is done cooking. In fact, we have so much time that I wanna share a quick word from this video sponsor, MyHeritageDNA. How far back can you trace your family history? Because I'm very excited to be partnering with MyHeritageDNA for this video. MyHeritage is a leading global family history and DNA service that makes exploring your family history easier than ever. It couldn't be much easier. They sent me this simple cheek swap kit, which only takes about two minutes. Now I gotta send the kit over to their lab. Very excited to get the results back. Okay, it's been a few weeks. My DNA test results are finally in. I hope you're ready for the reveal because I'm not sure I am. 50% Jewish, what a surprise. 19% Eastern European, yeah. 16% Greek, what? 6% Balkans. My entire ancestry is basically completely from the Pale of Settlement, which is the part of Europe where Jews were allowed to live back in the day. This is kind of in line with what I thought I was, but I do like that there are a lot more details, like Greece and the Balkans. I had no idea I had all of that in me. If you're also curious about finding out where your ancestry really comes from, this is the time. My Heritage has a promotion right now so you can get free shipping for your DNA test kits. To claim the offer, click the link in my video description or click this QR code. As a bonus, you get a 30-day free trial of My Heritage's best subscription for family history research. So don't forget to use my coupon code ANDONG during checkout. Thank you, My Heritage, for sponsoring this video. While our rice is cooking, let's work on our delicious sauce. Essentially, we're just making a sweetened soy sauce. And if you've never made one before, you should definitely try that because it's delicious. We start with one tablespoon of sugar. By the way, if you are also using measuring spoons like these, do the dry ingredients first, then the wet ingredients. It's gonna save you so much hassle. I learned this about 15 years into cooking. To that sugar, we're adding the exact same amount of soy sauce. You can use any light soy sauce you like here, but I would really recommend going for a good Japanese brand like Kikuman or something to really get that signature Japanese style flavor. Next, we have one tablespoon of dark soy sauce. Dark soy sauce is not super relevant to the flavor, but it is very relevant to the right appearance and color of this dish. That's what dark soy sauce is mostly used for these days. Now let's talk about one of my favorite ingredients of all time, and that is dashi. I don't even know how to describe dashi properly. It is traditionally made from kelp and like dried smoked tuna flakes. This is probably the most important building block of Japanese cuisine in general. And while normally dashi isn't a powder from a little sus looking uh, bag, in fact, normally it's basically a broth. But honestly, for a quick weekday recipe, I feel like using instant dashi powder is absolutely fine. For that nice and nutty note, we're gonna do two teaspoons of sesame oil. All the essential flavors are in here now, but for me personally, 
I like to add a little bit of pizzazz by adding just a little bit of white pepper powder as well as a little bit of curry powder. It can be Japanese curry powder, can be any curry powder really. And don't worry, your dish is not gonna taste like some weird ass curry, but this gives it just a subtle little hint of complexity. This mixture is really intense and salty as it is now. So we're gonna add a couple tablespoons of pure water. The last flavor we need is this, ginger. Personally, I really don't like chopping ginger. I kind of prefer grating it. There's one specific reason. If you grate your ginger, you're eventually gonna end up with this super fine ginger paste, which you can now just carefully squeeze into your sauce or whatever other dish you're cooking. The huge advantage being that now you have all of that beautiful ginger flavor without any of those annoying ginger fibers. Okay, sauce sorted. Next up, we got this an onion, because other than beef and rice, an onion is definitely the third essential ingredient to gyudon. The way we wanna cut it is top off first, root off second, slice our onion in half, get rid of that papery outer layer. Here's a tiny little bit of cooking science. If we were to slice our onions this way, they would stay more intact during cooking. Now, if we turn our onion 90 degrees and we slice our onion this way, the pieces of onion we're gonna get are more likely to kind of almost melt and fall apart in our dish, which for this particular dish is actually what I prefer. But like an onion itself, the flavors of onion we're gonna add to this dish have layers. We're also gonna be using scallions. We're gonna use these as a topping, but nevertheless, we do have to chop them very, very finely. And please do me a favor, go slowly and get them super thin. It's really gonna look so much nicer on your final dish. Next ingredient we're gonna need for garnish is this, which is pickled ginger. You might've had this stuff at a sushi restaurant. Sometimes it looks like this, sometimes it looks pink. You can absolutely use the store-bought stuff, even though mine is homemade. And if you're interested in how to make this at home, because it does taste a little bit better, please leave me a comment and I might make a short on it because it's super simple. With the pickled ginger, you just wanna make sure to chop it into super, super thin strips. There's one ingredient that in my world always levels up a gyudon and that is eggs. You can add a soft boiled egg, a sunny side up egg, whatever floats your boat. But for me personally, the best type of egg to add to gyudon is a poached egg. And for some reason, a lot of people, even the ones that are pretty good at cooking, shy away from poached eggs and today, I wanna change that. Let's quickly go over how I make my poached eggs and maybe I'll take your fears away. First, you wanna gently crack your eggs over a fine mesh strainer to get rid of excess liquidy egg whites. Collect your strained eggs in a little bowl. You can put them all in one actually. Now to a little pot with simmering, not boiling water, we wanna add about one tablespoon of white vinegar, a very generous pinch of salt. Both of these will help the egg firm up sooner and keep its shape. I take everything back about poached eggs being easy. About six to seven eggs in, still all we have is an ugly mess. <laughs> Especially the freshness and quality of the egg really plays such a huge role when you're poaching eggs. By the way, this is Andong from the near future, about two hours after we finished shooting, and we just redid the exact same method, and we just used very fresh organic eggs, and it works beautifully. So that means the secret really is to use fresh, good quality eggs and poach them for two and a half to three minutes. This is the result I was going for, and it's not, it's, re it's really not that hard. I wish I had bought good quality eggs for the first attempt, but I didn't. And by the way, that whole making a vortex for poached eggs, it doesn't hurt, but it also doesn't really help. So I prefer to just skip that part and go straight in with my eggs, poach them for roughly two and a half to three minutes, depending on how soft you like them, and then get them out. You can shock them in cold water, but you don't have to. Now let's get to the juicy part, which is of course the final assembly of all of our prepared ingredients. First, get a large skillet over medium high heat, to which we're now gonna add a knob of butter. Yes, butter. Let's get that going just a little bit. Don't wait too long. Before the butter burns, you wanna add in all your onions. While our onions are caramelizing and smelling absolutely beautiful, let me say a few words about that knob of butter I used. It's not just the fact that butter tastes amazing. It's also the fact that butter and soy sauce are a match made in heaven. So whenever you have a chance of using these two together, definitely give it a consideration. It's usually quite good. Our onions are looking beautiful, so it's time to add some beef. Try to flatten and break up the meat with your spatula. This is looking and smelling really good. And when the meat looks like it's about 80% done, this is the time to add and stir in your sauce. Cook those together for about one and a half minutes and you're good. Now for the kicker, 
turn off the heat. Now with the heat off, but everything's still super hot, I'm gonna take a second knob of butter and then gently but quickly mix that in. We're actually stealing a technique from pasta making here. If we're mixing in the butter over gentle heat, it's actually gonna emulsify into the sauce and make it more creamy. Can you see how glossy and beautiful that sauce gets? Now you might be thinking he added two big knobs of butter. Of course it's gonna taste good. To which I say, touche. But there's also something I didn't mention about the beef. Let me explain. Traditionally, you'd use very thinly sliced beef for a gyudon, kind of like what you'd find in a hot pot restaurant. We used minced meat today, which I mostly did because it's a lot more accessible in most countries, especially over here in Europe. But there's also another reason. With some types of minced meat, like the beef we use today, you will have the option of buying lower fat versions. So normally, minced beef has about 20% fat, but the beef we use today only has around 5% fat, which was an intentional choice. So that amount of butter was somewhat offset with, you know, lower fat beef. So let's assemble everything. Wait, the rice is of course done cooking now. Absolutely perfect texture. And if you're wondering why I can touch freshly cooked rice, it's because I've been making food YouTube videos for six years. And around four to five years in, you stop feeling pain. So here's how we're gonna plate this. First, around three-fifths of your bowl should be rice. Yes, three-fifths. Why are you laughing? Not one, one third. <laughs> no, fine, you could do half, whatever. Now, oh, no, I dropped an onion. There's visual contamination, now I gotta clean it up as if it never happened. The other two fifths have now been filled with meat, so the rest is pretty much just garnish. I like to go along the seam here. Now a little bit of pickled ginger for that extra kick. And of course, an egg. I'm always conflicted with any kind of like rice bowl. Should I mix it up or should I not? I try to do like a half mix situation where I mix a few things in the middle, but I still leave some rice and beef untouched, because why not? This, this is gonna be a good bite. Yes. I mean, yes, I'm super hungry, but also this just tastes very, very, very good. There are very few dishes where you really don't have to try very hard to make something taste freaking amazing. I'm gonna get a really good bite with some egg, some rice, some beef, some onions, everything. Mmm, so satisfying. Mmm, very good. I think AP should try a bite. Rice with meat, my favorite. Spoken like a true Filipino. Yes. Who doesn't like rice and meat? Yeah. Mm, butter and soy sauce. Mm-hmm. It works, right? Yes. It's a really good combo. Super good. Mmm. The sweet ginger. Super good. You learn a lot about flavor. That sweet soy butter combo is just mind-blowingly good. The addition of even powdered dashi adds so much to this dish. And I also love how, for example, you taste quite a bit of ginger, but you don't have a single morsel of ginger flesh in the dish. I don't know, could be my last meal. Thank you guys so much for watching. And also thanks again to My Heritage DNA for sponsoring this video. I really enjoyed finding out more about my family history. So if you are interested in this type of thing, definitely check out the link in the video description below. I'll see you guys in the next one.